Good Saturday evening, one and all. Welcome to Beyond 3D. Coming to you live from the Mornington Peninsula at RWP 98.7, 98.3. Matt and Clint here, sitting in Studio One. Clint, it's been a week, hasn't it? I'd like to say congratulations to the president of Montenegro. Yes, what about? For having an immense amount of humility and grace when Senor Fat decide to push his way through oh yes at the g7 yes, summit indeed. what are you gonna do well there's a whole lot of goodies going on around that but i'm not gonna dwell on that i'm gonna dwell on it i just think he showed an, an immense amount of grace and well, humility well what's happening right now is and i've heard this on a lot of radio shows in the united states they're calling it you know they're calling him the ugly american basically that goes around and just you know bullies his way into everything wants to be first has to take, be taken care of the whole bit so what are you gonna I love the fact that Melania dressed all in black mm -hmm. when she went to meet the Pope. Now, that's standard dress issue, isn't it? Usually, yes. Yes, yeah, so usually and it's a like, small and a head covering as well. Yes, yeah, so usually they say dress for the job you want. So I was looking at that <laughs> wondering, what's she going for, widow? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's been a lot going on with that. And another um, interesting thing that happened was the fact that, um, and I will bring this up because it is very important and it shows just how hypocritical some people can be. Kathy Griffin, they're making a big deal out of the fact that she held a mock head, beheaded head of Donald Trump up for a photo shoot. Didn't somebody last year lynch Obama or have a picture of Obama being this, lynched? This is the entire thing. You're talking about guys like Ted Nugent going in there saying he wanted to shoot the president. There have been effigies burned of Obama. They have had pictures of him being lynched. They have had pictures of him as a, you know, a gorilla. They have had all kinds of pictures of him in these kind of situations. And all of those people have all of a sudden forgotten all about that because this woman put up a fake bloody head of um, Trump. And she had a uh, interesting comedy career back in the 90s, didn't she? Way back when, yeah. Yeah, but uh, not as much now. But uh, believe me, they will hang her out to dry um, because they believe she went too far. But, you know, I think they went too far with um, what they said about Obama. But Ted Nugent, who said what he said about Obama, was a guest in the White House recently with Donald Trump. So who the heck are you kidding? I literally cannot understand. Well, I do understand it. It's a, you know, double standard. But, uh, hey, that's what's going on. And for all those people, um, news-wise, the other thing that happened this week that I thought was really sad was um, LeBron James, the basketball player, player learned once again that he was truly black in America because they decided to spray racist graffiti all over his gates. I I I, I don't <laughs> I don't understand. I don't what does most that... people with half a brain or people with the mentality above handball level don't understand. What, what am I missing here? Is it the whole racist thing? Like I what it basically is Matthew, I'm not black. Opinion, no, no, I'm not black, what it is so I don't opinion, know what that kind of here racism is, is here, like. No, no, no. Here it is, plain and simple. People are frustrated. People are upset. People, this happened. Now, guys, you're going to have to go back through your history. This has happened a few other times in the United States. Anytime something for minorities happens that is good, it is followed by backlash. And you can go through your history of the United States and you will find it. It started, if you want to go back to the Emancipation Proclamation and Reconstruction. You had the, well, the Reformation, then you had Reconstruction. And what they did was once you had something good happen, they had to go to Jim Crow laws. I think this is the United States way. I think still using the N word. Oh, yeah, all that is, stuff. Is detrimental. Yeah, well, you know, basically, here's what it, okay, I'll even get simpler. When you have a person that runs an absolutely positively and unequivocally hate filled campaign, this is what you get. Hopefully everyone has had a really great week. Clint, it has been a really interesting one as far as we're concerned. But one thing I wanted to start with was I wanted to thank Mr. James Bartley for last week 
Brooks show, which was absolutely spectacular. And guys, we will continue to promote James and his work because it is worth your while to get that kind of information. And what an awesome guy JB is too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He, I think he that's more cool. important. That's the most yeah. important thing. He's a good person, a good human being, and the information he is trying to put out there is actually trying to get us all moving forward. And I think that's very important. Um, this week has been interesting in so far as the usual stuff in the UN, the United States is going on. There is racism rearing its ugly heads. Um, I would like to send a special blessing to the two souls who showed absolute bravery in Portland, Oregon, um, and tried to protect women from a person that was belittling, berating, and threatening them, and they lost their lives doing it. And I think they deserve the thanks of that city, and they deserve our thanks as well. Do you actually want to give a little, what, what happened there? Very quickly, wrap, give, give me the quick a person version. who is known as a white supremacist or a racist mm -hmm. got on to a metro tram in Portland, Oregon, and he saw two women. One looked um, Middle Eastern, the other one was actually wearing a hijab, and he decided he was going to belittle, berate them, and tell them they had to leave his country. They were no longer allowed there. Three men stood up and told him to stand down and what he was doing was wrong, he decided that he would take out an illegal weapon, a knife, and stab two of them in the throat area, killing two of them, and the other one was in critical condition in a hospital before the police could get to him. Sorry, I had to bleep that out then. Whoa. It is... What a hero. What a pair of heroes. That's what I'm yeah. saying. You have to send them as many blessings as you can because they, what they did, they did for the right reasons. Now, the other thing that has to be stated was that the Muslim community in the Portland, Oregon area has already raised over $1 million for the families of these people. I think that is heartening about what's really going on here. It is a sad testament to what is going on in the United States. We all know what happened over in Europe with the meetings that uh, Senor Orange had. We all know what's happening right now with his health care plan that is going to remove 23 million people from the health care rolls. We all know what is going to happen as they are rolling back civil rights, even though most of the guys out there don't know that yet, but watch what comes out in the next three weeks. And we all know exactly what is happening with with people just being very, very negative. So, blessings to the two people in Portland, Oregon. Blessings to another person who was a lieutenant, just got out of university, Lieutenant Collins, who was also racially murdered at the University of Maryland during the same period of time. This kind of stuff that is happening is showing the world exactly what the United States of America is about. And the world is starting to reject that way of thinking and that way of life. It is a shame for the people in the United States of America that are decent human beings, God-loving human beings, and spiritual human beings. But what those people need to do is to stand up to exactly what is going on out here. Because as I had said a long time ago, and I will continue to say it, when you have a person that runs a negative, spiteful, hate-filled campaign that allows all of the evil people in the world to say, wow, we can come out and do all the stuff we wanted to do now because we now have a person that will back us, we're on the wrong path. Plain and simple. It's got to change. So what's changing? James, Bar James Bartley and the information he's giving. The fact that people are willing to give their life to help a fellow human being. Those are the positive things we have to take from this. It's part of that whole frequency vibrational upgrade, isn't it? There is, as we know, a big shift. The people talk about the age of Aquarius coming through. There is a big energy shift coming through. And what is happening now is that energy shift is stabilizing itself. You're going to start to see a lot more of this. You're going to see a lot of people that you're going to have to leave behind because they just don't get it. They're still on the old frequency, and as you move up to the new frequency, that's the way it's got to be. You've got to let them go. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody will be experiencing this All of on them. some different level. All around the world. Yeah. Everywhere. And, if you look and, around the world, it's going on everywhere. And if you're not 100% aware... 
focus on your friends and how they make you feel. Mm. If you find yourself that you have certain friends that you enjoy spending time with mm. and suddenly you no longer feel comfortable around them, it's because you've shifted and they haven't. Mm. Absolutely. So recognize that for what it is. And the other thing you'll find if you're on a good spiritual path and you are evolving, you're going to be asked for help. People you may, who may not have asked you for help prior are going to start looking to you for advice and answers and stuff like that and give your counsel as best you can because you have to help as many people as you can to raise their vibration to match the frequencies that are coming through. You have to do it. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. And we have to take a break. Welcome back tonight to Beyond the 3D. Matt. Yo. Something very interesting happened this week. Ooh, what is it? Robert Bigelow. Robert Bigelow? Robert Bigelow. Mm hmm I love the fact that I can drop this and you have no idea what I'm talking exactly. about. Exactly. Did you know that Robert Bigelow, in an eye-opening interview on 60 Minutes, our Monday night, so mm -hmm. Sunday night in the States, mm -hmm. aerospace mogul and entrepreneur, Matthew, mm -hmm. Robert Bigelow said he was absolutely convinced there were alien visitors to Earth. Oh, wait a minute. I did hear a little bit of something about that. Rob Bigelow, Matt, said that there has been and is an existing ET presence and that he has spent more money than anybody else in the U.S. on this subject. I don't blame him. I don't blame him. But the fact of the matter is I believe him. You just said that. I did hear a little bit about that, but the name didn't connect. Now I'm connecting with it because when you told me what it was, I agree. I think he's correct. I think most people, if you're honest with yourself, you know something else is out there. Well, 60 Minutes said to him, do you believe in aliens? And Big Lay responded, I'm absolutely convinced that's all there is to it. Hmm. And they said to him, do you also believe that UFOs have come to Earth? And his response to that was, there has been and is an existing presence, an ET presence. And I spent millions and millions and millions. I probably spent more as an individual than anybody else in the United States has ever spent on this subject. Mm. And 60 Minutes again said to him, is it risky for you to say in public that you believe in UFOs and aliens? And Big Bigelow responded, I don't give a damn, I don't care. So they said to him then, you don't worry that some people will say, did you hear that guy? He sounds like he's crazy. And Big Bigelow's response was again, I don't care. It's not going to make a difference. It's not going to change reality of what I know. Bravo for him. I know. Do well, you not Steven. call that some kind of a disclosure? Oh, I think it's a. Dis I think it is a disclosure. Um, but the fact of the matter is, okay, guys, disclosure has happened. That's part of it. Stephen Greer was part of it. Do not rely on a government entity to come out, stand out there, and make a press conference stating we now are acknowledging the fact that this is happening. Forget it. I'd be. I'd go, do it. I'd go as far as saying that a government entity would probably be the last. Yeah. Bastion, they would come forward. They're the last that would come forward with the information, but if they were to land somewhere, they'd be the first one there to try to greet. That'd be like Trump at the G7. Yeah, just basically. Stepping just, through and pushing Montenegro out of the way. That's basically what would happen. So, yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Bigelow. I think that's uh, I think what he is saying is valid, but I think what is important is it's his experience. Yeah, that's and true. And when you have an experience that you know is valid and you know it's not airy fairy and you know you've had a physical experience that matches a spiritual experience it doesn't matter what anyone else says that's all that matters is you know that experience is valid it is true it doesn't matter what other people say how much money do you reckon he's pumped into the aerospace program have a guess I couldn't have a guess but I'd, I'd probably say a billion to be on the safe side if it's a little higher a little low it doesn't matter but I would say a billion well I'll tell you what that's more important well, it's not more important, but it's interesting. How about this? You saw that the United States just had a test of its anti-missile missile. Its anti-missile missile missile? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Or its anti-missile missile. Anti-missile missile. How much did that cost? Half the amount doubled. For the, yeah, quick, yeah, for the test. How much did it cost? I have no idea. Oh, take a guess. Blind Bambi. What does that mean? I no idea. Oh, ha <laughs> ha. Now, um, <laughs> keep uh, you on your toes, Matthew uh, Adams. Yes, you are, you are, you are, you are. How much? Just take a guess. 
You have to send a missile up from the Marshall Islands, goes up into the sky. $174 million. You're about $50 million off. Far out. $224 million. I was never very good at accounting. <laughs> $224 million to have one rocket get shot up into the sky and to have another rocket blow it out of the sky. That one time cost $224 million. What that means is that if Kim Jong-un over in North Korea decides to send up 10 missiles at well, once. We're looking at over a, bi over a billion dollars. You know, and the United States has to shoot them down. First of all, their strike rate on this new system that they put in is 50-50. So that means all he has to do is let one get through. But it's it would cost a couple of, what, two and a half billion dollars. Yeah, it's a lot of money. In order to stop that kind of stuff. It's a lot of money that these guys are spending on stuff like that. And so it's not like you'd want to send up your old rockets first to get rid of them first, yeah, would you? Right. Because you actually want to target, make sure you have a 100% target, right? Yeah, that's right. But, but with Mr. Bigelow, I think that what I'm hoping, at least, is that if they know this... Um, Look, he's the head of his own aerospace company. Well, what the contracts he would have with NASA and a lot of the other aerospace companies and the secret clandestine meetings that they would have had mm -hmm. with technology coming in, mm -hmm. um, he would have been privy to a lot of really cool stuff. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting insofar as now a lot of the stuff that's going to go on with outer space, so to speak, is going to be private companies. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's not going to be government controlled, even though the government wants to control it. And the way they control it now is they're saying, well, if you launch a rocket, you're still going through what we considered restricted airspace. So you have to make sure that you are avoiding their restricted airspaces. That's how they catch you. It's because like once you're outside of the atmosphere, they don't own it. They can't do anything to you. It's like the alien franchise where everybody mm. works for the Wayland Yatani Corporation. Mm -hmm. And they just go off into space and mine asteroids for mm -hmm. precious minerals and... Mm. This is what these guys are doing. So the companies, they're starting to maneuver around all of these so-called government entities or working with them as best they can, so that way they can get a lot more done. But what they do, Clint, you're right, they find out a lot of the interesting little tidbits and goodies about what's actually going on. And then all of a sudden, they meet this person, that person, this mantid comes up, as uh, James was talking about, and next thing you know, they're like, well, first thing that would happen is you'd get angry because you would realize that the, your so-called government has been lying to you for the last hundred years about what's actually going on here. And then as you start to work through that, you start to look at the government as what it truly is, a little rotten little bastard child off in the corner somewhere and just leave it be and just don't even get involved with it and keep doing what you want to do. Like the red-headed stepkid that lives under the house that you yeah, feed that fish heads to through yeah. the crack in the floor? Basically. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> and so once you have all of that taken care of, you just start to say, right now, I have to expand. Take a look at what's going on when you go out into space, guys. Tycho Crater on the moon. Ooh. They have found some good goodies Yes, sitting up in there um, from a long time ago. There's so many things going on out there that we are trying to be kept in the dark about because once it happens, even Stephen Greer said this, as soon as he was over in the Whit Sundays talking to about 100 leaders from all of these countries about what was going on with free energy and everything like that, he said he was getting the death stare from all of them that assassin look whereas and you think we want this kind of information out there so all of a sudden all of our natural resources we can't use anymore this is what they're doing didn't half of them at that meeting were happy and half of them at that meeting wanted to drown him yeah basically yeah and that's what happens so there's a lot going on out in space like we say this all the time keep looking up at that moon you see more things every time you look at it telescope set up in his backyard mm. and I didn't ask him at the time what it was pointed at <laughs> He handed me a piece of welder's glass, mm -hmm. and I went to put it over the eyepiece, and as I felt the heat come out through the eyepiece, mm -hmm. I realized before it was too late. And uh, yeah, not fun mm. looking at the sun mm. through a high-powered telescope without welder's glass. Mm. Yeah, well, what we do is we take the, um, the, the, you have a Barlow lens in, and then you take the uh, 45 or a 90-degree lens, and you point it down, and there's a you can get the white sheet and just look at the sun through that as it comes through the lens. It's, it's, it's an easier way to do it. If anybody wants to know how hot that actually is, he held up a leaf mm -hmm. and I think he held it about two metres away from the eyepiece and the leaf caught fire mm. from the light refracting back out of the, the eyepiece of the telescope. That was amazing. 
all the interesting things that are out there, and they found a couple of new ships in and around the sun. Um, I'll put the website up so you guys can look at them. Some very interesting... You mentioned the mantids before. Yep. We were talking last week to James about... Reptilians. Thank you. Um, I've got some stuff here on mantids. If you're interested tonight, if you want to play some nice. mantids for our people at home, let's play this. Back in the early 1990s, one of the most significant communications I've ever had as a TV producer and investigative reporter was from a woman named Linda Porter, then living in Porterville, California. And her very first letters to me were about her memory of various types of beings doing something to her body that she did not understand, wanted me to help her with. And I asked her if she could send me illustrations. And she ended up sending me a package of some 20 all color, very well done. She was by art background in school, an illustrator. And in one of those, as I went through the next package of these illustrations, it was a praying mantis, green, vertical pupil eyes, orange and gold around the black pupils. And she noted that it was approximately eight feet tall and she depicted herself in this illustration as being a small 17 year old as she was at this time in 1963, age 17 in Covina, California, which is where this abduction took place. And in her notes with this illustration, these are some of the words that she wrote. And I'm reading from the big section that I entitled Body Containers and Souls of Light, Linda Porter, talking about the tall praying mantis. He was very tall, between seven or eight feet. He had a very long torso. The arms were very long and articulated back away from the torso, much different from the way a human being's arms would be. There were three finger-like appendages, but they did not move like fingers. They have much better dexterity, and his feet weren't anything like our feet. They were very thin and narrow, tiny, pointed things. His eyes were sort of reddish-brown with clear bubbles on them that bulged out slightly, and she means something like a sclera on our eyes. There was a covering that was protecting the colored part of this praying mantis's eyes. I don't know if that was a form of protection. It was like he could feel what I was feeling, and he did not want to frighten me any more than was absolutely necessary. And I asked her, did you sense emotion, any kind of emotion? And she said, great age, wisdom and infinite patience it isn't so much kindness and compassion it's like he and his type have been around for thousands of years a long long time the one thing i feel the strongest is the incredible wisdom i have never been in the presence of anything like that before that gave off the feeling of such knowledge he told me a great deal but i have no idea actually what he said at the time it was important like telling me what was going to happen in the future and something about my being translated into the light and she capitalized l on the light whatever that means it has to do with what happened to me in that room filled with light and my last memory ends with me about to enter that room well now i'm going to summarize pages of what happened she encounters a what we would today call perhaps an even as opposed to a gray android meaning a prime gray intelligence that is approximately five feet tall they have vertical pupils in their eyes and this being demonstrates for linda porter that he has a man laid out on some kind of a table and this is all telepathic that the man's heart is failing and that it is vital it is so vital that the entity which she understands is the man's soul must continue in exactly the same kind of genetic container 
that the man has been and the gray uh, directs her attention to another version of this man in a tube with other beings each being is in a tube with light coming from above and light coming from below and she gets the telepathic communication these beings are cloned they are at different ages they are sustained by the light that may be the praying mantis's uh, explanation for translated in the light and that the gray being asks her to watch and a gold light comes out of the man lying on the table enters a man who is 10 years younger than the chronological age of the one who is dying and dead and then the slightly younger version of the container now comes alive and is on the floor in front of her and the great being says this is important that we do for you the same process and explains that she had rheumatic fever when she was a child which she did her heart is damaged and that if they do not intervene and give her a new clone body at age 17 she will die earlier than these beings think that her soul needs to be inside of the very specific container that was Linda Porter continuing to live on this planet from age 17 going forward. Now, all of this occurred and she is not the only one. The section of my book uh, goes into several others, but hers is the most detailed and dramatic. And out of this experience from her interaction with this praying mantis, she ended up sending me another uh, letter and she says quote from this being the praying mantis put in my head there is much much more to existence than we could ever begin to understand much of what we have been taught regarding the physical universe and the laws that govern it is wrong this creature's civilization communicates difficult concepts via the use of symbols that radiate emotion they use this form to get concepts across with their exact true meanings intact no misinterpretations can occur this way the symbols are not mathematical ones but appear as three-dimensional holographic pictures that resemble abstract sculptures the emotional aspect is relayed via carrier waves that resemble sound waves but are not part of the human sound spectrum these waves can be felt but not heard if the creatures want to clear a certain area of humans they can broadcast this carrier wave over the area at a certain frequency and it will create intense fear in people causing them to flee the area it does not cause any harm so they say and that's exactly what John Keel wrote about when he was studying the Mothman prophecies in Virginia and said that he walked into zone a zone of fear that he could step in and out of and he knew intuitively it had to be technology generating a frequency that translated into his human brain as absolute fear same idea she continues from the praying mantis problems arise when trying to translate this visual emotional input into words human semantics can cause explanations to become mired down in confusion what is extremely easy to comprehend on one level of existence using one form of expression then becomes very hard to interpret correctly when translating translating it onto another level using a limited form of expression such as the human language a lot of meaning is lost and many important concepts become hazy or totally misinterpreted there are countless word world dimensions occupying the same space without being aware of one another because of having their own individual octaves this means frequencies this octave frequency holds the world dimension in place and causes it to exist safely without interfering with or even being aware of other worlds around it 
This frequency acts as a buffer zone to keep everything in its place. You do anything to disrupt it, and you begin a collapse that starts a deadly chain reaction. If the density of this collapse reaches a certain weight, space-time itself begins to collapse, close quote. And finally, this makes me think of an airline pilot. He was flying for United Airlines. The year was 1990. I was working for CNN in Atlanta, Georgia. He tracked me down there because he wanted to communicate that he had been exposed in his military career leading up to becoming a United Airlines pilot. Exposure to the UFO phenomena and the propulsion systems that were being studied by people he was working with. And he said, Linda, you have to start thinking about the lights and the craft that people see in the sky a little bit differently because not all are matter craft. Many are tears in the dimension between this universe and another. And the government's concern is they have discovered that electromagnetic fields on this planet can collapse. There's some natural collapses at nine regions, which is what Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso wrote about in his work. And that when there is a collapse of a magnetic field and there is anybody out there beyond the Earth who has technology that can detect that, they can use the collapse of a magnetic field to enter hop, move point to point from someplace else in the universe to where that magnetic field collapses if they are monitoring our planet. And in that collapse, that they can enter, and he said, not everything out there is good. And one of our problems and challenges is trying to understand the agendas, knowing that we are dealing with advanced, advanced technologies that can come and go on this planet and have for millions of years. And we are still living with all of this kept secret from the general human civilization. The praying mantis, Whitley, the praying mantis, the more I have studied this the last three and a half decades, the more it is always associated with something having to do with souls being taken out of cloned bodies and put in other cloned bodies in the context of something that is vital. And what I wonder, given the confusion that we have, where some people that I trust and they are really good humans, they feel that there is something that they're uh, afraid of that is not good in the praying mantis, whereas other people like Linda Porter and GS sense tremendous, uh, as she said, not necessarily compassion, but a tremendous amount of emotion. And other people in the abductee uh, syndrome have said to me, when I've encountered a praying mantis, I feel that they are as old as our solar system and that they look at me with great sadness as, they, as if they know something about humanity that we do not know. And I got this letter, which I think represents several that I did get. It's kind of a perfect summary of many other people uh, having experiences out there. And as you alluded to, when you get into the praying mantis, it is like scratching the tip of an iceberg. There are so many people who have their own stories to tell out there. And so many say, I've never told anyone this before because I think people think it's crazy, and yet the praying mantis is a common theme. And here is this email, December 19th. I had, as since I was a young boy, I have remembered like waking dreams, playing with a group of juvenile mantis children about my age while on a craft, meaning a round UFO. I had another lucid dream of actually being a mantis 
and trying to teach a classroom of young humans and finding it very difficult to do. I recall being given an opportunity to have a human life and discover more effective ways to teach human beings and understand them and their emotions that are largely mysterious to the mantis race. It happens that I was born dead. My umbilical cord was twisted around my neck and I was blue and I was still born. The doctor was able to revive me. I'm wondering now if I might be a walk-in who took over this vacated body. As a child, I sometimes had adults ask me where I came from because I was quite different from my parents in perception and perceptive abilities. Now that represents, that email represents lots of others that I got with variations. And all of this swiftly leads to what puzzles me, confuses me, and I am very, very much trying to understand. And that is the March 6 to 8, 1981, alleged briefing given for then newly elected President Ronald Reagan at Camp David by NSA, CIA, DIA, NRO, Intel, led by the current uh, director of the CIA, who was a colleague of Reagan. In that briefing, that is for what first surfaced in the SERPO, S-E-R-P-O material that you can just uh, put it in a URL, just do a search, a Google search on SERPO, and this would be in 23A. That's what this briefing for Reagan is. I have had a person who worked in an administration after Reagan tell me that he knew for a fact that the transcript of this briefing of Reagan is absolutely accurate and true. If so, they break down five different non-human types that the Reagan administration intel people say that they were struggling to work with, understand, back engineer technologies. The first four that they talked to Reagan about, they said were basically friendly. The interesting part is, the first one would be in the Eben category, like the one working with the praying mantis that showed Linda Porter, the dead man on the uh, on the table and the translation into the light into a clone body. And they said to Reagan that this top one extraterrestrial biological entity made by cloning, and they called it rapid cycle cloning, and they even put in the uh, briefing uh, RC, uh, rapid cycle, RCC, uh, as a technique that they knew that the extraterrestrials used so that they would bypass any fetal and baby stage, that they literally could clone adults into these uh, light tubes. So they're saying that the Ebens made, they're the top ones, that they made the next one called the Arkeloids, which were reptilian in nature, had uh, reptilian eyes with vertical pupils, had huge noses, had a, a domed head, and that they would be probably the Sumerians on Earth, cloned bodies by the Grey Ebens. The third on that list had also been made and cloned by the uh, Ebens, and that was a sort of a some kind of a, a lizard type. The fourth was called the Heploids, and they did not describe physically. I wonder if they are the blondes, the talls, the humanoids. I do not know what the Heploids are, but the fifth, Trontoloids. This is a direct quote. These are nasty insects that we call hostile alien visitors, and they can camouflage on Earth as blonde humans. But it's not my understanding. It is shape-shifting with the praying mantis. It is the same tubes in the Linda Porter case that they clone any body that they want, and then they can project. They
their life and consciousness into the containers that they make. And that's why this is a 16-layer chess game. Nobody knows which players on, are on which level on in what move unless you know the scheme of how they do this rapid cycle cloning and have, have some way of delineating with infrared or I don't know what technology, who is homo sapiens sapien and who is a human body that has been made in rapid cycle cloning technology but is inhabited by a non-human. The fourth category in all of this from my perspective is that we are now currently in a hybridization phase that is being manipulated perhaps by the praying mantis and the Ebens to replace Homo sapiens sapien with a completely different clone body and essence. And that this would be considered threatening to the establishment and that this may be one of the lines drawn in the sand that is interpreted as hostile when from the praying mantis's point of view it may not have anything to do with hostility. It may be that they feel they've made a mistake in the Homo sapiens sapien genetic manipulation of already evolving primates on Earth and they need a different life form here that is not as destructive. I really do think that as time goes along it has more insights into the truth of what is happening than just about anything except for some of the segments like Linda Porter. And here is one quote that gives you this fourth category of manipulation of planetary life systems through genetic manipulation and the manipulation of timelines. Quote. And this is uh, from his interaction with praying mantises and uh, greys. I feel that the non-human entities have conducted genetic testing on mankind for centuries in order to alter human genetics and guide our evolution to a point where they can harvest a genetic component for cloning and or hybrid that has the ability to contain a soul, close quote, and that this actually does make sense. Do all life forms have souls? If they do not, in this universe, having a soul that is on an evolutionary machinery in which there's reincarnation and moving on to other universes in the divine field has to be the highest e-ticket out. And if you are not in that category and you are destined to stay in this universe of entropy, you are in a universe that is fading out. When people say, well, what kind of aliens are there? How many aliens are there? People said that there's 100 different kinds of aliens, 200, I have five, I have 9 million different aliens. What the actual statistic is, is that what the actual, what we actually see is there are very tall, very thin looking aliens. People say, God, they look like a, a praying mantis. Yes, yes. Those are the ones in control. Within that praying mantis group, there's actually a, a hierarchy that we can see. There are some who do, who, now we come to crazy stuff, who actually wear some sort of cape or gown or robe or something or other that I would, I laughed at when I first heard it. Now I hear it all the time and I realized, oh, I, now I understand. They are the ultimate ones who will have the, who are in control of the hierarchy. There's, it's got to be, a, there's a hierarchy of authority. There's got to be, there has to be all sorts of different things that happen to have this program put in. That's a whole nother talk and that's another hours worth of talking yes. that I could do in terms of, of how this program gets put into place. But, um, then there are the regular <laughs> insect-like ones, and eventually you get to uh, taller gray aliens, smaller gray aliens, and hybrids. And then some people say they see some that look like they're reptilian. Reptilian, they're, they're rep this one's like, oh, this one's ugly. He's look like, he's reptilian. Mm -hmm. So I've asked people to draw what a reptilian looks like, and when they draw it, 
they're all over the place. Some look like they're made of sort of like alligators. Some look like they've got scaly skin. Some look like they're aliens, just regular aliens. Uh, some look like you know, there, there's no there's no set look for a reptilian. It's sort of a variety. I think that these are hybridization aspects that that we're looking at. Uh, that that were offshoots or different for different reasons within this program. The bottom line is this. They're all seen together. They're all working in the same program. They're all abducting the same people. We see the reptilians every once in a while. It's a very, very, very small part of the abduction phenomenon, mm. but we do see them. Uh, and that is all we see abducting humans. That is all. Something shifted differently than my usual meditation. I had this tremendous sense of acceleration traveling up my spine through my head and out through the top of my head, passing through some very dense belt of matter as I went to the edge, and then finally into this void of black space. And at that point, for the first time, my eyes looked forward and I continued to travel into this vast void. And in the same way, when you're at a red light or sitting alone at a cafe and you could feel somebody looking at you and you turn your head to the side and you see someone's checking you out from the next car or from another table. In that way, I felt a very intense focus on me, though I couldn't see anything initially. That's when, out of nowhere, this huge face and eyes appeared before me, something I had never seen in any pictures, had never read about. I'm looking at what now, I guess, I would come to identify it as a mantis being, but at the time, I'd never read about them or seen pictures of them. It looked like a gigantic, and what I mean by gigantic, I'm guessing somewhere between 20 and 30 feet tall, because there's no cross-reference point in space to anything. But as it was coming toward me, the head was the dominant feature and the eyes, and it had that very triangular face that a praying mantis would have. The insect praying mantis, though I didn't think of a praying mantis at the time that I thought, it was only afterwards when I spoke to some meetup group about UFOs that I shared my experience and someone said, oh, that sounds like a mantis being. And I said, oh yes, it looks like that. I was overwhelmed by the power of presence that was suddenly before me. The minute my eyes could actually identify its shape and form, before I could even say, oh my God, this is so repulsive or scary or foreign looking to me, before I could even have a complete thought in that way, waves of thought energy flooded my being and it was really a wave of love that filled me, one of the most powerful experiences of love that I can recall. And as I was overwhelmed by that warm feeling of connection, though to my eyes, it was a repulsive image before me. The sense of being overwhelmed by love and the thought was, we've been together before. And in my questioning, I said, in this form, meaning me, or in your form, as in you? And the response was, no, like me, meaning this alien being. And the confidence was that we had been together before and we will be together again. And at that point, we pivoted because we're facing each other head to head. And then suddenly, for the first time, it's as if we're beside each other. And it said, you've had to come to Earth to learn certain lessons. And one day we'll be united again in this form as we once were. And that was my only understanding. And I thought, come to Earth for a few lessons. I feel like I've been there thousands of years with many incarnations. And what was surprising to me was that in all the years, in the 24 years, I was coming and going to India 
studying under the so-called enlightened master in the Himalayas. We've discussed reincarnation multiple times, but I never entertained the idea that reincarnation included beings outside of our earthly domain. So while I entertain that we could be everything from a blade of grass to any of the animals to humans and go back and forth in the varieties of life for whatever lessons and corrections there were for us to make. It was never really in my realm of conceptual understanding that this also included extraterrestrial beings or beings of another dimension altogether. Everything I understood was in my own language, my own thoughts in my head, but I could see that they were clearly coming from the being whose eyes were so intense that they just traveled right into me. It was very disarming to be in front of this being that was between 20 and 30 feet with very long extending arms that almost looked mechanical in how they bent and moved, but the eyes was what captured me and held me, and the feeling of love, of peace, of security, which I didn't expect at all when I saw it, and yet the minute those eyes met mine, I just knew it was like being home. I understood that it was a school for the soul and that the soul takes on many shapes and forms for its own growth and evolution. And until that moment, I never imagined it could include extraterrestrial beings as part of that soul journey. That was a new lesson for me that I'd never been exposed to before. And the other new lesson was seeing this mantis-like looking being, which I had never seen or read about up until that experience. So. This one is perhaps the most impressive and lingering of all my life experiences, so that too strikes me as strange. When those words or those thoughts came to me, there was a very quick flash of many, many different lifetimes that as a few frames per second and within a couple of seconds, I saw maybe dozens or more lifetimes, but they were not new to me. They were experiences that I believed I had perceived in other meditations when I used to live in India. So it's as if that tape got replayed very quickly of multiple lifetimes and of a soul or a consciousness taking on different bodies to continue its journey of expanding awareness. There were many scenes from many lives, all of them taking place on Earth. Some as human, different than I am today. Some as plant life, some as animal life. Variety of expressions of humanity. I could see myself in all of them, all qualities. And yet, in the one where I was told we had been together before, as this magic like being and we will be together again in that one it was perhaps the most full of the emotion that I associate with love it was seeing me at the deepest core of how I identify myself it recognized the collection of all the different qualities that I call me whereas in all the different lifetimes I said oh I'm some wanderer in the woods in India. I'm a fish swimming against the current. Regardless of the I that I assumed in that body, when I was with the mantis being, it was like I was the core upon which all these other incarnations were like superpositions upon. The last understanding that I had while we were side by side, it was to my left side. We were both looking towards Earth at that point. And what I understood was, you've got more lessons to learn while you're there, and we will be together again soon in this form. The body is a container for the soul consciousness to live and experience. And whether that experience is known in the container of a human being, an animal being, or an extraterrestrial being, that just may be the process for all of us, that we are physical containers for a more subtle consciousness and dimension. We have to be more than just 
humankind spinning through space without any relationship to life beyond and that we aren't the only unique life and that there is a consciousness that travels and is spread everywhere in the universe just the same. In fact, that is the only reality. Welcome back to the night. TV on 3D, Matt. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm of the mind that we as souls are doing that anyway. We are ultimately upgrading ourselves. It's like if you go back to, oh, 1980, dating myself now, if you go back to 1985, um, you would buy an IBM 256K, five and a quarter inch floppy drives, two of them, monochrome screen, dot matrix printer computer. 1985, they still had Commodore 64s then, didn't they? Probably. Probably him later. Um, and that computer would cost you about $4,000. Today, you know what we all have out there, the different computers we have. Um, you could take, I always used to say this, you could take the newest flight simulator program or the newest train simulator program, and there would be no way you could use that. Did you just say train simulator? Yeah. The damn thing goes on a track. It's not like an airplane where you can take it anywhere. Oh, but you have to learn to drive steam trains. Oh, come and on. To, well, Nobody's any, doing I digress, that. I digress. Nobody's doing that. Seriously. Oh, there are a whole lot of people out there that love train simulators. But anyway, the fact of the matter is we're constantly upgrading. You upgrade your computer. You upgrade your phone. You upgrade the personal body you are in right now. But it just people just tend to do it lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Recycling? Not even recycling. It's Up a matter soul. of... of the, no, it's not a recycling recycled soul the soul doesn't the soul doesn't die your spirit lives forever it's just a matter of the different vehicle that you are going to interject yourself into so you can operate in the so-called world of matter and you can continually upgrade it so at this point in time the average lifespan is somewhere between 80 and 100 ultimately it will get up to the point where it'll be 180 to 200 because the body will be upgraded medicals the medical areas and the medical field will be upgraded if you really want to know in my opinion what the catalyst will be to really shift it it will be Sorry to say it, folks. It will be the, 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 the end of the use of fossil fuels. And the fact that the planet will be cleaner, more pristine, there will be more oxygen in the air that we breathe. And I'm actually expecting the planet to counter-correct. Oh, so am I. I'm hoping. Itself very, very soon. Absolutely. And it's going to be devastating. Yeah, well. Worldwide devastating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who gets to live and die will all depend on your geography. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and that's a lucky can, dip, too. Nah, some people have already scanned that um, energetically, and they know where to be. Um, and that's why you were starting to see a lot of the so-called elitists in the world purchase properties down this way and in New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to being in the northern hemisphere. But if you guys want to know what the Earth will look like if it is not done properly, all you have to do is look at Mars. And that's all we have time for tonight, Matt. That's the way it works. Another week down. Mm -hmm. Another one to go. And then one after that and after that and after that. So you guys take really good care of yourselves and we'll catch you next week for another edition of Beyond 3D. And we have some awesome guests coming up in the next couple of weeks too. So don't forget to check out our Facebook page, mm -hmm. Beyond the number three hyphen and the letter D. Take care, people. Good night, everybody. Just because you haven't experienced it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Thank you.